Please join me now in welcoming Senator Kelly Ayart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and it's really an honor to be here with all of you today. And I do have to make one correction to my bio, which is a new one. Uh, I was actually appointed last week to serve on the Senate Budget Committee, and so I gave up the Aging Committee to have the opportunity to do that. And the reason why I bring that up today is not not to not to necessarily correct the you know my biographical information, but you know today is the 750th day without a budget, um, and when you think about what we do every day, whether it's at your family level, at a small business level, when you think about the fiscal crisis that's facing our country, and what we just went through with this uh, fight over the short-term continuing resolutions, you know, you'd think at a minimum the first thing we could do is put together a responsible budget for our country. And so I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be on that committee. Uh, but right now in Washington, uh, the Democrats are in charge of the Senate, and they have not brought forth a budget. We're not sure. As you know, the House has passed a budget proposal, and we really need a budget for this country, which is a, a basic tenet of anyone even running their household. So uh, I thought I would bring that to all of your attention in terms of some of the things that are, are, not, are pretty dysfunctional uh, of what need to happen to get our fiscal house in order in Washington. Today, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, some national security issues and also focus not only on national security, but how that relates. Uh, I think initially, every discussion we have right now uh, in this country, we have to start with the fiscal state of our country and where we are, because it really does inform our analysis of every other issue uh, that we're looking at. And I would very much like to uh, thank the Institute for having me here today and President Michelle Easton and the Heritage Foundation's Bridget Wagner for this opportunity to be here. Uh, your, this institute plays a very, very important role in mentoring and training future leaders. And I want to say to all of you, we need you. <laughs> we need you to get involved. We need you to be engaged. We need you to be uh, involved in the civil discourse, and hopefully I see uh, some folks here in this audience that will also think about putting their name on a ballot someday because uh, we need conservative leadership in this country. We need more women conservative leadership in this country. And so I would hope that you will come forward because you have so much to offer in terms of the dialogue that we're having, having right now and we will need to continue having to shape the direction of this country. And the reason that I, I got into uh, running for the U.S. Senate is I'm the mother of two children. Uh, I've got a, a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And frankly, I just couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore and watch what's happening to our country. And, you know, my husband and I spent a lot of time, like many of you, I'm sure, feel yelling at our television at home uh, about the direction that our country was taking. And so that's what prompted me to run for the U.S. Senate. And I had been an attorney general, but I had been an appointed attorney general. And so I had never uh, run for office before. And so took that leap to run for office, which is not easy. But I'm here to tell you that for those of you that think about that in your future, you can do it. And there are people that can help you, even if you've never run for office before. And if you have that conviction, we need you now more than ever to, to jump into to our political discourse. And so I, I'd be happy to help anyone here who's thinking about heading in that direction and to give you encouragement and try to direct you to the right people, because uh, we need reinforcements down here in Washington. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is just start with, when we think about our national security, the unprecedented uh, $14 trillion uh, debt that we have incurred right now as a nation. And as we see, our situation is really only getting worse uh, based on uh, the proposals that, for example, the president put forward on his budget plan. And uh, the actions that we have been been taking in Congress has not really got to the bottom line of addressing these issues. When you think about borrowing $4 billion a day to sustain our government or, or 40 cents on the dollar we're borrowing to sustain our government to actually just run 
the operations of our government. It's quite staggering, and it's quite staggering when you put it in just terms of your daily life, if you were running your, your, your life that way. I think we all know what, what would happen uh, to our family budgets, what would happen at home. And just in February alone, we ran a monthly record deficit of $225 billion. And so when, when you put that in perspective of the CR debate uh, that we, you know, just had over $61 billion, uh, and that being labeled, I think, by many Democrats as extreme, one month alone of borrowing $225 billion. And I think that puts it in perspective that, of course, that wasn't extreme, and that was just a start in the direction where we need to go to get our fiscal house in order. Um, and we, you know, we spent, there's a lot of discussion and more discussion we have to have about uh, the spending in Washington, and that was the number one issue when I ran for office, and I think it continues to be and should be the top legislative priority to get our fiscal house in order in Washington. And the reason I raise that is uh, today, because I want to focus on some national security issues, is the relationship between uh, our fiscal state of our country right now and other issues, including our economic strength and our national security, because we need to recognize and appreciate that the economic foundation of our country is also the foundation for our national security and our strength. And it was Thomas Jefferson who said, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our election between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. And the threat that the debt poses to our freedom is clear. Yet the impact of the national debt on national security and military strength, I think, overall may be le less appreciated. Uh, we've, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the, the quote from, from Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who has said that the national debt is uh, the greatest national security threat that we face right now in the country, and, and I have to fully agree with him on that. The United States has the very best military in the world. I'm proud to be part of a military family myself, and it gives me, uh, I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to serve on the Armed Services Committee to make sure that we put ourselves and continue to put ourselves in a place to protect our great country and uh, also to make sure that we are supporting those who have sacrificed so much uh, for us and continue to sacrifice so much for us uh, as we still have troops in Iraq. We obviously a huge number of troops in Afghanistan and also other areas around the world. And, but when you look at the fiscal state of this country, uh, we spent roughly 5% of, of, of a, our, 5 of our GDP on national defense. And by the way, that's not, when you look at 5% of what we spend on our national defense, uh, there have been other times in our history where the amount that we've spent has been much greater uh, than that. And when you look at it and you look at the national debt and where we are, I, I'm worried that when you think about how much we could be paying just on the interest on our national debt, it really swallows up the other choices we have. And one of the fundamental purposes of why we formed a government really is to protect our country. It's why it's in the Constitution that the government has a responsibility to provide for the common defense. And if we, if the growing debt that we have, when you think about the interest payments, we can crowd out our other priorities. We crowd out uh, just the amount we're paying on interest, national security costs, but also other choices that we want to make um, in terms of how we would want our taxpayer dollars. And that's why this is such an urgent issue that has to be addressed now. I don't think we can continue to kick the can uh, down the road. And just to put some numbers in perspective, according to a January 2011 report by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the government's annual net interest spending will more than triple between 2011 and 2021. And what that means in terms of numbers is from $225 billion a year in interest to uh, close to $800 billion a year just in interest. And we will double our share uh, of GDP, which is, of course, the size of our, our economy, from 1.4% to 3.2% just in interest. And net interest is primarily determined by the amount that the Treasury pays on the debt that is issued to the public. And according to a report done 
by the Heritage Foundation, uh, by 2020, net interest payments will account for 18 percent of federal spending if we continue on the current path, and defense spending will only account for 14 percent. So I want to put that in perspective when you think about do we keep putting this off? We can't. We can't put this off any longer of what we need to do to protect our country. So sometime in the next decade, our interest payments will surpass defense spending if we continue where we are. And right now, we are enjoying very low interest rates. And in part, that's because of what our Federal Reserve has done to keep interest rates artificially low. And one thing we need to do to keep our eye on is that uh, the minute that changes, and it will change, and interest rates will rise at some point here, it drastically increases the amount we owe in interest. So our debt problem just grows bigger and bigger as soon as the Fed stops some of the policies they put in place to really keep interest rates artificially low. Uh, both of these dynamics, a shrinking pie and a shrinking slice of the pie, will result in fewer resources for our military and obviously other areas uh, within our budget. And as one of our primary competitors economically, and uh, there's been so much discussion about our relationship with China, China is aggressively investing uh, in because they've had double-digit economic growth in their defense capabilities, in their Navy. And the U.S. will be struggling to maintain its military edge. And the quantity and quality of resources that we provide our troops will decline. And our investments in research and development will suffer. And I think there will be a move, of course, to decrease our readiness for that the readiness is our posture to be able to defend ourselves for conflicts we haven't yet identified. It's just, it's just our level of preparedness to keep our country protected. And so this dis disconcerting scenario really is ex exacerbated by our, our national debt right now. And when you think about the countries that could challenge our military primacy, when we talked about China, uh, you know, half of our debt is owned uh, by foreign countries, and the single largest foreign holder of our debt is actually China. So when you think about that, doesn't that also put us in a position of strategic vulnerability, that uh, the country that is our single biggest holder of foreign debt is also uh, a country that really doesn't share our values at all uh, in terms of freedom and democracy? And we've seen uh, some of the crackdowns that they've had on free speech in China. And it is also a country that we are in a competition with in terms of, of uh, our national security and making sure that our military uh, remains the strongest in the world. And as Admiral Mike Mullen has stated, because of the posture that we're in right now, that's why it's so important that the economy move in the right direction. And because the strength and support and the resources that our military uses are directly related to the health of our economy over this time. And the amount of money we are owe is directly related to the strength of our economy. The markets react to, they see the fiscal state of this country. We saw recently, and I'm sure many of you heard about S&Ps giving us a negative outlook on our bond rating. To me, that should have been uh, another, another example of a shot across our bow here in Congress to understand how great and how deep this problem is and how urgent the need it is to address it right now. And I'm very glad that Chairman Mullen continues to highlight this. I think we need to continue to focus on this and, and make sure right now we stop kicking the can down the road. I'll say it again. Bottom line, I, as a new member of the Senate, oh, I've talked about how we've gone 750 days without a budget. We should be spending every day on the floor right now debating these issues. As the greatest deliberative body in the world, uh, the, the deliberative body should be working on the single biggest threat to our country, and we should let real debate occur uh, on the Senate floor with an unlimited ability to amend uh, bills that come forward, bring a budget forward, bring over the House version. Let's, let's have a real debate and address this for our country. Some of the initiatives that I'm supporting uh, in the Senate co-sponsoring is a balanced budget amendment to our Constitution. I'm also supporting a spending cap proposal, 
and we saw that uh, the last time we did a spending cap, uh, Grand Rubman Hollings, that Congress found a way around it. Uh, I think some of the proposals now, the CAP Act is a, is a stronger proposal than that proposal to try to get around uh, some of the ways that to put the uh, handcuffs on Congress, which is important. But a spending cap alone can still be overwritten by Congress, and that's why I also support a balanced budget amendment. And finally, we have to address entitlement reform. You can't take 60 percent of the spending that we have off the table and expect that we're really going to get our fiscal house in order. And I see many of you in this audience are, are uh, younger, and some of you are more senior, and uh, everyone should care about entitlement reform and getting it done right now. Because the longer that we put off the decisions on how we're going to reform Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, the more difficult the choices become. And frankly, for those of you who are younger here, this is a discussion you should be engaged in right now um, on the debt and the deficit because we are spending your money, and it's irresponsible. And we are also, to the extent that any of these programs that you would pay into are going to be present uh, when you come to retirement age, they aren't uh, unless we address reforming them now. So not only will they swallow up, swallow up the choices we have in terms of how we spend our dollars, uh, but the programs aren't sustainable for those who most need them and would rely on them. So I look forward to, I think many of us that are new in the Senate, look forward to the Senate operating how the Senate should and really getting down to what needs to be done to protect our country. And uh, there are very difficult choices to be made. There aren't a, th these aren't easy choices where uh, everything can stay exactly as it is right now. And we need to be able to think uh, think outside the box. We need to think forward in terms of doing the right thing for our country. And I look forward to doing that. And I would just say to urge everyone out there, speak to your representatives and say, now is the time to do this and do what you were sent there to do uh, to address these challenges and stop focusing so much on the 2012 election. Let's focus on saving our country. I would now like to discuss a, a couple of issues that I'm working on uh, in the Senate related to our national security. And one of the foremost is this: the our war on terrorism. Nearly 10 years after September 11th terrorist attacks, we still remain uh, at war uh, with violent extremists who want to kill Americans and our allies and those that share our beliefs. Uh, yet. One issue that has not been resolved uh, by the administration, and I think the administration has taken us in the wrong direction, is that we don't have a solid laws and program in place to deal with the issues surrounding detention, interrogation, and trying current and future terrorist detainees. Now, my background is as an attorney general, and when I got on the Armed Services Committee, my jaw dropped uh, when Secretary Gates appeared before our committee, and I asked him uh, if tomorrow we caught the number two uh, in Al Qaeda, Al, Al Zawahiri, where would we put him so that we could interrogate him to gather information to protect our country? And the answer I got back was, I honestly don't know. Well, that's a pretty, pretty staggering and, and uh, unacceptable answer when you think about where we are right now. Uh, we need to be able to gather valuable intelligence to protect our country. We saw it with the recent uh, capture and kill of Osama bin Laden that intelligence gathered from uh, detainees at, at Guantanamo Bay detention facility and around the world was critical in getting the right information to be able to find uh, where the compound was, and to be able to to uh, capture and kill Osama bin Laden. And so the fact that the, when the administration came into office, they were so set on closing Guantanamo Bay that they didn't have an alternative. They didn't have a viable alternative plan uh, that would protect our country. And they continue to keep pressing. In fact, Attorney General Holder uh, nearly 10 days ago, reiterated even after the Osama bin Laden uh, raid and capture and kill that they planned on still closing uh, the Gitmo facility. 
And so as the new member of the Senate, this just shocked me. And the other thing that shocked me was that those that we've released from the detention facility, so 25% of them have actually gone back, gotten back into the fight, and are still committing terrorist acts against us and our allies, suicide bombings, uh, plotting terrorist events, harming, seeking to harm Americans. And uh, among those that have been released, the number two in al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, one of the top commanders of the Taliban has been released. And it's become, frankly, somewhat of a badge of honor among terrorists to have been released from Guantanamo Bay and actually to go back in theater uh, and continue to fight us. And so we've created this situation where uh, we have a detention facility. The administration has come in and said we should close it. They have no alternative to it. And so we have have this situation and we've released people prematurely uh, who are now back in fighting us. And we need a strong detention interrogation policy to protect our country. And so that's been a keen interest of mine in the Senate. And I've been working. Last week I introduced a bill along with several other senators to keep uh, the Guantanamo Bay detention facility open. I'm also working on a set of proposals uh, that deal with uh, detention, interrogation, and habeas claims that are brought uh, by uh, the, the detainees to make sure that we have the right policy in place. And I firmly believe we're at war, that our policy should not be to use civilian trials to try terrorists. And I'm someone who tried criminal cases. So I understand well uh, the merits of our criminal justice system. But our criminal justice system wasn't set up to deal with classified information, wasn't set up to deal with the context of someone that we're at war against, where you really have an overriding intelligence interest and also just having a trial, a civilian trial in, in the country can make you a target of terrorist attacks. And we saw the great opposition of the American people that rose up uh, when the Attorney General said he wanted to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, in New York City. And now he, I I agree that he has finally backed off. I'm glad to see that. And we'll be trying him at the uh, courtroom at Guantanamo Bay in a military commission. So you'd think that this is a debate that we wouldn't continue to need to have. But we do. Uh, We do because we've also created a situation where uh, by continuing to want to close uh, the Guantanamo Bay detention facility, if you think about it, uh, it puts our troops on the ground and our special operations forces and our commanders in a very awkward situation. Because if they capture a high-value target in an area outside of where we're at war, so outside of Afghanistan, Yemen, some other area, where, where, and they have no idea where to put them, uh, doesn't that put them in a very tough position? And if we are going to send them to third country, other countries that don't necessarily share our values, we could actually be undermining uh, how we would treat prisoners in that instance, as opposed to having a secure facility that we have built already at the Guantanamo Bay Detention Facility. So all of it, in my view, defies common sense, and that's why I'm continuing to push this issue. And I went to the detention facility. I wasn't going to sit aside and decide to introduce this bill without really seeing what was going on down there. And because I was a murder prosecutor, I've been in a few prisons in my time. And I went there, and it is a top-notch detention facility. Uh, the, those that are being held there have, there are international press that goes in and out, so checking on welfare, full contact with uh, the Red Cross, and their religion, uh, special meals are given to them. This is all respected and incorporated what is done down there. And frankly, they, they get better treatment than they deserve, uh, but The treatment there is consistent with international law, consistent uh, with uh, the best probably prison in the United States, because frankly, my impression was, having been in a few prisons, that it was nicer than most of the prisons uh, that I had been in, and frankly, they were given more rights than many prisoners that are being treated that are obviously criminals in our country 
are treated. So uh, to close this facility when we have no other alternative and to really say uh, that to our, our men and women who are in the intelligence community and in our defense that, that uh, you just should just be left out there to find some third country that might, might be able to take these is just the wrong approach for our country. So I'm going to continue to push this issue, and it's just the wrong direction for our country. We have to continue to protect our country by gathering valuable intelligence and making sure that those who are terrorists aren't put in a position that we would release them back to be able to commit acts against us again. I prosecuted murderers, and I wouldn't allow a murderer to receive a small sentence so that he, could, he or she could get back in to harm the public. It's a basic premise of public safety, yet this administration doesn't seem to be following through on what we need to do to protect our country. I also went to this, the courtroom there when I was at Gitmo, and I wanted to mention it for a minute. Because I, as Attorney General, I tried cases before when I was a murder prosecutor, I tried cases. So I've been in a few courtrooms in my time. And they have a state-of-the-art courtroom at Guantanamo Bay that would rival any federal courtroom in the United States. And it is set up specially to be able to have the trials we need of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 co-conspirators, uh, those that are being held at uh, the detention facility to make sure that a military commission trial can be held there. And one of the important features of the courtroom is it is specially set up to protect classified information. There is a gallery where the press can be. Uh, so this would be a, a court. Uh, if we had a military commission, there would be times when the press would have access. But it is also set up if something sensitive is comes up to make sure that the courtroom is uh, blocked off in a way that's appropriate to be able to protect classified information. And that's much more difficult to do in a civilian courtroom in the United States. So the notion that we would close a facility that's top rate uh, just for the sake of doing so uh, doesn't make any sense to me. The other issue that I wanted to mention, because it's been raised so much lately after the raid on in Pakistan and the capture and kill of Osama bin Laden, is Afghanistan. Uh, I wanted to touch on Afghanistan because there's been some who have raised recently that because we have captured and killed Osama bin Laden that suddenly we should prematurely withdraw from Afghanistan. And I think that is the wrong approach. And I traveled to Afghanistan in January right after I got sworn into the Senate. And in that capacity, I was briefed by General David Petraeus and also met with uh, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. And I'm, I did also meet with uh, Hamid Karzai. And based on my trip, as well as detailed briefings from our leaders in the military, uh, we, we have made progress in Afghanistan. I don't think that gets as much attention in the press at times. Uh, but we've made progress on two important fronts. We have really changed the momentum achieved by the Taliban in 2005. And as well, we have uh, put ourselves in a position where we have trained so many more of the Afghan security forces so that we will be in a position to be able to transition more security over to these forces. We did not have a robust training program in place uh, prior to the counterinsurgency strategy led uh, by General Petraeus. And General Caldwell, who is in charge of that training facility, it's basically we have trained, it's grown by over 122,000 since the beginning of 2009. And why is that important? A lot of these folks, they can't read, they can't, to be in a position to even know basic military tactics to be able to take over their own uh, defense of their country. They didn't have any of that basics. That's why we're providing that training to them. And if we want to transition security to uh, Afghans to be able to defend themselves, this is key. So we are making progress in Afghanistan based on the change in strategy that we had there that was, of course, the same strategy that we pursued in Iraq uh, to succeed there. You know, the other encouraging signs is that there are portions of Afghanistan that the NATO that we're turning over from the NATO-led coalition security over to the Afghan forces themselves. 
I raise these issues because now would be the worst time uh, to suddenly withdraw from Afghanistan after we have sacrificed so much to achieve what we have achieved at this point. And as Secretary Gates has recently said uh, when asked about whether we should withdraw right now, he said it would be premature. And I agree fully with him on this. Uh, don't get me wrong, we have some huge challenges still in Afghanistan. We have challenges with corruption in the Karzai government. Uh, we have challenges in terms of, if any of you have been to Afghanistan, it really is uh, very much a, a place where they haven't had economic development. I mean, it's a dusty and difficult place uh, where our troops are right now. And uh, that said, the challenges that we face uh, we cannot allow Afghanistan to become a launching pad for terrorists again, and we cannot, uh, particularly because of Pakistan, suddenly leave uh, the situation and then let it be worse off than when we started in Afghanistan. So I think you're going to continue to see this discussion in the coming months, and that's why I wanted to raise it with you and think th the goal was never just to get Osama bin Laden and leave. If, if that were the case, we certainly – put a lot of troops up and have sacrificed a lot to get one man. Um, and it was a very, very important mission to capture and kill Osama bin Laden. But there are many others that will follow him out there that continue to want to harm, harm us. And we're fortunate that we were able to gather in the compound where he was found uh, what is, what I, as what I understand, will be valuable intelligence to prevent future attacks. But while we have them in this position, we have to keep pushing rather than back off right now. If the message is that we're going to back off, I think we're sending the wrong message to our enemies right now. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you've seen the continuing discussion about Pakistan. And there's no question that we need to ask uh, the very difficult questions about uh, what Pakistan knew and why, why it either it was a matter of complete incompetence or they knew, obviously, that Osama bin Laden was there, and we have to get to the bottom of that. That said, we, we need to also bear in mind that Pakistan's influence on our conflict in Afghanistan is a very important one, and that relationship is one we need to examine very carefully. Uh, but in the tribal areas of Pakistan, there is, that is where the Taliban are hiding and also with members of al-Qaeda and also homegrown uh, terrorist groups. And they're crossing over the border into Afghanistan, and they make it very difficult uh, for our troops. I hope we use this moment with Pakistan to really up the pressure on Pakistan to root out terrorists within their own country. If we're going to continue to give them billion dollars, billions of dollars of aid, we need to have an honest discussion with them, and we need to hold them more accountable for rooting out those terrorists that are causing, obviously, harming our troops. But they are also committing terrorist attacks against the Pakistanis themselves. So they have an interest in their own security. But the last thing that we should allow is we have to bear in mind Pakistan has a nuclear weapon. The last thing we should allow is more fundamentalist elements within Pakistan to take over that government. So the strategic importance of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan are intricately intertwined. And now is our opportunity to hold Pakistan more accountable, but we can't lose sight of how important it is to our mission in Afghanistan. So as you, you see us having this discussion going forward, uh, these are some of the issues that I see, and I will be looking to make sure that we hold them accountable to root out their own terrorists that are harming us. Those are some of the high-level national security issues we face. And obviously, there, we could probably spend a couple of hours here talking with the Arab Spring and what we see happening across the Middle East and what the implications are uh, as a result of the Arab Spring for us and our allies going forward. I think that there isn't a clear answer that anyone has in terms of where we will be as a result of what we see happening in the Middle East. Uh, but it is an uncertain time in the world, which brings me back to my original point. Uh, given some of the uncertainties we see in the world, uh, the terrorists that we know 
who are still out there that want to harm Americans uh, and our allies. We need to make sure that we get our fiscal house in order so that we can provide for the common defense, which is a fundamental of our Constitution. And we also need to make sure we get our fiscal house in order. As the mother of two children, I don't want to answer that question to my children years from now when they ask me, Mom, what did you do about it? Uh, as they're paying the bills for our failure to take responsibility today. Uh, and I feel blessed, and I'm sure all of you do, to live in the greatest country in the world. Uh, I want to make sure that we remain the strongest country in the world. And if we're not the world leaders, then who will take our place and what will their values be? And I don't think that anyone can take our place in terms of what we stand for in this country, in terms of freedom and democracy. And that's why what is at stake right now is so important. And I feel privileged to have the opportunity to be a new member of the Senate uh, at this time in our country's history. Because now more than ever, I think, is when we need real leadership. We need people who are willing to look beyond the next election to make some of the difficult choices that we have to make to preserve the greatest country in the world. So thank you for having me today, and I would love to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Senator. What a great, uh, what a great discussion of critical issues of the day. We have a couple of microphones here, uh, here and then here. Do you want to raise your hand if you wouldn't mind giving your name and your affiliation? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Cochran with the Reserve Officer Association. I, first of all, I want to thank you about your comments about Afghanistan and uh, Gitmo particularly, and to thank you for you and your family's service to the military. And a couple weeks ago at the Senate Armed Services Personnel Subcommittee hearing, you asked Secretary McCarthy about the Yellow Ribbon Reintegration Program, and there's issues in six states, including your own. I was wondering if you had an update. And also I was wondering if you had a comment, if you had time to review the new report about the future role of the reserve components and what your feelings are about it. Uh, th th thank you very much uh, for the question. In the conflicts that we've been involved in, uh, we have relied more and more on the Guard and Reserve. I'm married to a Guardsman. I, I appreciate that. And one of the things, the challenges with the Guard and Reserve, where we've had multiple deployments, is they were our part, they're part time, intended to be our part time soldiers, leaving their civilian jobs to go and to be a supplement to our active duty forces. But they've become operational. I mean, every member of the armed services at every level agrees with me that they're really an operational force now with what we've asked them to do in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so some of the programs that are, have been in place in the active duty to help with the deployment cycle, which what that is is preparing you to deploy because you're leaving your family and you're leaving your civilian job. And then when you come back, uh, the issues that you have, when you think about what our, our soldiers face and what they see there, there are many issues that flow from that, and the issues that flow from it are, if I'm coming back to a civilian job, how do I reacclimate to that job? Uh, there, there are mental health issues that can flow from just the experience of being uh, deployed, and that doesn't even include those who have received physical injuries as a result of, of being deployed. And you've left your family for this period, and when you leave a family, it, it's, not, it's not as easy getting back and transitioning to civilian life when you've been in the intensity of war. So we've had these programs in place in the active duty to deal with that, that cycle. And we haven't had the same commitment in the Guard because traditionally we hadn't thought of our Guard as an operational force, how we've used them. So that's where the Yellow Ribbon program, these deployment cycle support. In New Hampshire, we, we saw this as an issue, and we came up, uh, our, our Guard, has done an excellent job in coming up with a public-private partnership, uh, working with Easter Seals, working with state, working with with uh, private employers to maximize resources to put those programs in place, so that the challenges are even more acute with guardsmen and women. Because when you come back from war in an active duty context, you all go back to the same base, and you're you're around a bunch of people who have been through the same experience with you. When you're in the guard context, you come back into your civilian job and you're not surrounded by people who have been through the same experience with you and you, that support network. So that's really what those yellow ribbon programs do. 
And uh, New Hampshire's program, as a result of the, the continuing resolution, actually will continue um, for that and, and also in those other states that we identified. Uh, and we have to be able to be in a position with limited resources to engage the private sector too. It's one of the reasons I'm proud of our program in particular because it's cost effective and engages every sector. Government can't do it all and I think that partnership is key. So that, that is the issue. I have not had a chance to review the report that you've identified and we, Brad Bowman who's my military legislative assistant, we'd be happy also to follow, follow up with you on that. I had a, a readiness, I'm the ranking member on the readiness subcommittee in armed services. One of the issues we have to address overall for our guard and reserve is because we're, we're using them, what will be the guard and reserve of the future? Will they continue to be, uh, if we're, we're going to ask them to continue to be operational, how will we make sure that they have the same level of equipment, the same, because we're asking the same of our active duty, and I think that's one of the challenges of what that guard and reserve will look like going forward, uh, given what we've asked of them. Yes. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Larson. I'm a Heritage work here. And I'm also a Navy, retired Navy wife, and spent three years at Gitmo. So it was nice to hear you talk about Gitmo. Wow. I have a couple concerns about Gitmo that just came out recently by the Red Cross statement that they're trying to work to get the prisoners' mm -hmm. families over there to visit. And since I was a dependent on Gitmo, I think the security of the residents there are very important. I don't know what your committee is working on with that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that is worrisome and I wanted to see what you thought is we're talking so much about bin Laden and how we caught him and security issues and how those things were obtained. Is that really important that it's out on everything that we have and telling the whole world how we obtain that information? Uh, Mary, thank you very much. First of all, thank you so much for your service. One of the things that I took from my experience of traveling to Gitmo is the folks that work there are top-notch, and they have very, very difficult jobs, and they don't get enough credit. So thank you for, for, what you, for serving at Gitmo. I, I just want to just say briefly, in the prison setting, the guards at Gitmo, wh who I talked to a lot when I was there, you know, the prisoners, they, they, they do things like throw feces, cocktails, on you and these guys and gals have to ma maintain just no reaction and it's a difficult difficult job day in and that day out to deal with that setting or, or uh, the prisoners find things that they can say to you just to try to get at you um, about your country about your family and and this is the correctional officers at the domestic side go to this to some extent but it, I think it's even greater when you're you're dealing with um, those who want to harm our country. And so I appreciate what you're saying. I have concerns about uh, what has been announced in terms of family visiting Gitmo. Uh, I would like to know more about what their thought process is with that and how they're going to ensure the protection of those who our families are stationed there at that naval base, as well as obviously making sure that the families aren't used to bring in information or to bring out information, and I think that's a key security concern. Our committee has not uh, brought forward, there hasn't been any hearings on this yet. Uh, I hope that we will bring that forward and those issues, because if those key security components aren't there and we can't assure that things won't be brought in and out to communicate to the outside world, I think that's, that's a big issue that we, we need to address and get to the bottom of. Oh, there's, and I think there's. Hi, Caitlin Corb with the Cato Institute. Um, on the, uh, you mentioned very appropriately how, how much of a security threat uh, the national debt is and um, our out of control spending and entitlements. Um, what, is there anything on the, on the issue of raising the debt ceiling, are there any kind of systemic spending cuts that would be strong enough for you to, to, for you to consider voting in favor of increasing the debt limit or is that off the table for you? No, thank you for raising that issue. I think this is a very, very important opportunity 
So we, we keep repeatedly raising our debt limit. And so will we raise the debt limit again and uh, basically give give Congress and the administration a, a blank check and another credit card? Uh, it doesn't make sense because if you put yourself in that situation at home, you wouldn't do that. You'd tear up your credit cards and you'd say, uh, what am I going to do to get things in order here? So I would like to see serious reforms. And from my perspective, what I'd like to see is balanced budget amendment, uh, spending cap, and also entitlement reform, because I think those are the three components that we should be addressing right away. Uh, uh, so I'm not saying that there aren't any circumstances that I would would not, would vote. Uh, there would be circumstances where I would vote, but only under the, the the premise where we are taking serious action to make sure we get out of this continuous cycle, because I'm not going to perpetuate that cycle as a new member of the Senate of uh, just giving the blank check and not doing what we need to do right now. Um, and one of the, when, you know, we hear the administration out talking about the catastrophe that we're facing if we don't uh, raise the debt ceiling. Well, I think it's a catastrophe to continue on the path that we're on right now and to pass on to my children, your children, and all of you uh, this massive amount of debt with, with not recognizing that the urgency is here right now. Last question here, maybe somebody over on this side. Hi, I'm Nikki Neely from the Independent Women's Forum. I appreciate that you have mentioned entitlement reform because the Senate de Democrats have not addressed that. They're just basically playing ostrich and putting their They're hiding in. from it. Yeah. Um, if, if you were able to write your ideal budget, what kind of entitlement reforms would you propose? What would you like to see happen going forward? Well, I have to say first up that I very much commend the courage of Paul Ryan. When, when you think about someone who's really a leader, the fact that he has gone out in a very difficult issue and put out a very substantive plan. So I think we should be looking at the Paul Ryan plan. Um, and to me, uh, taking that, if people don't, you know, one of the big criticisms I have for the president is where's your plan? If, if you're so critical of Paul Ryan and it's so wrong for our country, then give us an alternative because I'm willing to look at any constructive alternative uh, so I think that's where our starting point of the discussion should be. And uh, I also think that on Social Security, we should be looking at issues like raising the retirement age. Uh, we, I, I think if, if all of us got together in a bipartisan fashion, we know we could fix Social Security tomorrow. And we can preserve for all of those who are in the Social Security system now, relying on Medicare, and also for those even close to it, we can, but the longer we put off that decision, the more people it brings in and the more difficult it becomes. So now is the time to do it so that all of you who are younger here can plan for what, what this will look like in the future for you. We're living longer. And those who are here that may already be recipients of Social Security, we preserve it for you now. Otherwise, the recent report that just came out from the trust fund has already moved up the date where uh, the dates have been moved up in terms of the sustainability of Social Security and also Medicare. Uh, so we can't continue to, to bury our heads in the sand. And I'm willing to continue to look at any substantive proposal. Let's just do it right now, solve it, and move forward. One more. One more. I'll, I'm, I'm happy to do one more. Sure. Okay. Thank you. One more. I think we're, we're doing OK. I'm Daniel Madsen with the National Journalism Center. Thank you so much, Senator, for coming. I was just wondering. Um, what do you hope will be the outcome of the talks that Obama will have tomorrow with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have any hopes for the outcome? You know, I, I do I do have uh, hopes for the outcome. I think it's very, very important that, of course, the president reiterate our support for Israel uh, as uh, our strongest ally and, and really the ally in the Middle East that shares our values. Uh, I think that's very, very important. I also think that I hope that they have a discussion about what we saw recently happen with the Palestinian Authority uh, reconciling with Hamas. I just I think the administration has to be strong uh, and continue to be strong on the issue of the fact that unless Hamas uh, gives up any form of violence and agrees to recognize Israel, then I don't see how we can be in a position 
to continue our support uh, for the Palestinian Authority, nor will there be any opportunity for a real resolution uh, in the region. And finally, while we can create conditions for peace in that area of the world, the parties themselves have to be willing to come. We, we can't we can create conditions and we should encourage, but we have to allow the parties to come forward on uh, to, to be able to be in a position to come to a real peace because we the United States isn't isn't going to be able to force this on on uh, that area of the world. And I think that's important to reiterate uh, in the discussions with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I actually went to Israel recently, so I had the opportunity for the first time to be in Israel and, and actually to meet with the Prime Minister and uh, the Defense Minister, Ehud Barak. The other issue that I think that the administration needs to have a discussion with the Prime Minister about is uh, the, what's happening in Egypt. It's so important that we make clear to Egypt to preserve uh, that peace agreement uh, between the Egyptians and the Israelis. As they go forward to elections in the fall, we need to be clear to Egypt that that peace agreement is very important um, and that the rhetoric that you use in terms of there being anti-Israeli rhetoric does matter, and it really does matter in terms of of uh, the stability in that area of the world. So those are some of the issues I'd hope he'd talk with them about. Thank you.